Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to MEI's Defense uh, Leadership Series, which is in its uh, seventh episode today. I can't believe we've done six already. Uh, our guest is retired uh, Rear Admiral uh, Joseph Serkis from the Lebanese Armed Forces, who is joining us from uh, Beirut uh, today live. My name is Bilal Saab. I'm the founder um, and director of the Defense and Security Program at MEI, where I'm also a senior fellow. The uh, Defense Leadership Series has now become a core component of uh, this uh, program, and I'm, I'm very proud of it, uh, given the content it's releasing and the caliber of guests uh, it has had the pleasure of hosting. We were especially fortunate, uh, I should say, um, to have CENTCOM Commander General uh, Frank McKinsey inaugurate the series on June 10th of this year. Admiral Serkis is our first guest from the region, uh, though not for lack of trying uh, to bring on other military and defense officials from the Arab world. I should say that topics related to national security and military affairs are quite sensitive in that part of the world and few officials are willing to speak, especially if they are still serving. But hey, we'll keep trying uh, and we'll keep pushing. That remains my promise, which I've been trying to honor for almost a decade, which tells you that I'm not doing a good job. Uh, let, me, let me say a couple of words about Admiral uh, Sarkis, uh, who's a good friend of mine, and then we'll get right into it because we have a ton to cover. Uh, Joseph is now a non-resident scholar with MEI's uh, Defense and Security Program. He retired from the Lebanese Armed Forces, I'm going to call them the laugh for the remainder of this conversation, after a career of 37 uh, years, uh, during which he held a variety of command and staff positions, including most recently uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for planning from August 2017 to December of 2019. And in this uh, latest role, uh, Joseph was responsible for strategic planning uh, to include capability development uh, of human material, uh, financial resources, and of course, operational issues to cover, of course, in his space, uh, maritime security, border protection, land and sea also, uh, developing and establishing concepts, uh, doctrine, metrics to measure uh, the LAF's effectiveness. He led the strategic dialogue also, importantly, uh, between the LAF and UNIFIL, which is the UNIFIL, uh, the UN force in Lebanon, for the implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701. And before overseeing strategic planning, uh, Joseph was the naval assistant to the LAF uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations from June of 2012 to July of 2017, and he did command LAF naval operations from August 2004 to June 2012. He did a lot during that period, including countering smuggling attempts and facilitating emergency relief assistance, search and rescue and recovery at sea. In addition, of course, to the uh, delimitation of uh, Lebanon's maritime boundaries and drafting national laws related to the sovereign maritime rights of the country. There is a lot more that uh, Joseph has done throughout his military career uh, for which he has received many honors and awards, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you to please check out his bio on the MEI website that he's a member of the family. And I will say that Joseph graduated from the French Na Naval Academy. and He completed his uh, professional military education uh, in the United States as a distinguished graduate in military strategy from the Naval War College. He does hold two master's degrees, uh, one in international relations from Auburn University of Montgomery. Just don't tell my wife, she's a huge Alabama fan. Um, and the second in military operational art and science from Air University, Air Command and Staff College in Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, Joseph, first of all, welcome to the MAI family. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the team. Congratulations on your well-deserved retirement and thank you for doing this with us. Over to you. Well, Bilal, thank you for the, um, for the introduction. It's, it's my, the honor is mine. And thank you for having me today. It's my pleasure to be with you. Hopefully today I can add my modest contribution for a better understanding about LAF. Thank you. You got it. Before we uh, start this conversation, let me emphasize this because I think it's important. Uh, Admiral Serkis does not speak uh, for the Lebanese Armed Forces. As I mentioned, he is happily a retired civilian in his beautiful home now in Beirut. So all the views he will share with us this morning are his and his only. They do not reflect those of his previous colleagues in the Lebanese Army. But it was important for me to say that one more time. Okay, 
we have a lot to cover, uh, Joseph, uh, and we'll try to do this as uh, uh, usual uh, within the next hour. Um, but I want to start with current items because uh, those are issues that are on the mind of a lot of people. Uh, there's quite a bit of interest uh, in those issues. Um, since the uh, explosion uh, in the port of uh, Beirut, tell us what role has the LAF played on the ground? Has it been uh, coordinating with international organizations and maybe even governments uh, regarding the distribution of goods uh, and humanitarian relief. So what role has the LAF played on the ground since the explosion? Well, Bilal, let me st start by saying that what happened is, is outrageous. It's a massive blast, immense suffering. But now I think on the way to recover, thanks to the international humanitarian assistance, the U.S., Part of it, always there. Not to forget, I mean, the Young Lebanese Initiative, local associations, and for having LAF at the center of the recovery effort, in fact. So let me start by saying that assistance and disaster relief is, is one of the core missions of LAF. So to that end, LAF established what, what we call today is the Beirut Forward Emerg Emergency Room. It's the uh, intended to orchestrate disaster relief efforts working on two fronts, actually. So you have on one front, you have Beirut port and, and the surrounding inhabited uh, areas now damaged, unfortunately. So the objective is obviously to maximize impact, efficiency and transparency. So currently you have, you have LAF assisting in removing the rubble. Uh, I think conducting also damage surveys and planning for the subsequent actions to be taken. And LAF, and LAF is, is coordinating the whole effort of distribution, actually, and this is where it's the, the most important role, to cover supplies like health, shelter, emergency food, and construction material. And according, I think, to uh, the last official statement of LAF on August 29, 50% of the whole received humanitarian assistance were distributed by LAF to families in the damaged areas. In addition, I think LAF is leading also on the damage survey with 250 dedicated military and civilian engineering teams. And the objective here is to try to rehabilitate most of the damaged houses before November 15 winter time. So to finish answering your question, I think it's worth mentioning, though, that international parties have entrusted LAF to, to make sure that their assistance goes directly to the people in greatest need of support and, and not to fall in the wrong hands. And my understanding is, on that line, that LAF is, in its current and significant role, is receiving and is staging and is coordinating the whole effort of distribution and I, and, I, and I trust it is in full coordination with international partners, the civic society representatives, and the active registers NGOs. Okay. Um, there's always a risk of overstretch uh, with the Army, given the, the portfolio that it has, and especially recently with the obscure clashes in multiple areas in the country, and now it has to take a leading role in coordinating with the uh, uh, those international organizations and international uh, governments. Uh, let me take you a step back uh, before that, because obviously there's a huge political crisis in the country and there's been a, a good number of demonstrations in the streets, um, even before the blast and most likely will continue uh, given the uh, miserable state of affairs of, of governance uh, by the politicians. Um, during those demonstrations, uh, Joseph, there were concerns that elements of the left were seen beating up protesters uh, uh, and um, uh, there was just, I guess, videos of showing that. Uh, can, can you just, given what you know, uh, obviously, can, can you just help us clarify what happened and uh, have those concerns been addressed? Um, and then add to that, uh, what role should the army play to reduce tensions uh, moving forward? Uh, since, as I mentioned, the protesters most likely will return to the streets. Um, and uh, air their concerns and grievances, which is absolutely the right. Well, Bilal, thank you for bringing this up. 
I know there is a, there is a lot of expectations regarding lap soul. So if, I, if, I, if you ask me where LAF stands today, well, what is obvious to me these days is where the others stand from, from LAF, actually. LAF on one side is, a, is suspected by some Lebanese politicians for not responding appropriately to popular protests. Uh -huh. and, and at the same time, it is accused by the demonstrators themselves, actually, for using excessive violence. And LAF has been in, the, in, in, in this extremely delicate position for the last 10 months. Yeah. And everyone knows, I mean, and you know that the media is not helping and LAF is not voicing. Right. The, the, the media is showing these violent clashes and, and most of the time it is refraining to show how the agitators amongst the peaceful demonstrators are, are using violence and provoking LAF soldiers. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see on daily basis, like most of the Lebanese, how LAF soldiers continue to show courageous restraint despite the violence against them. Although I completely approve the people's expectations, I mean, to have LAF protecting their, their right of, to peacefully demonstrate, and, to res and, and I respect I mean, and also the respect of the demonstrators' freedom of expression. So mm -hmm. this is all, I mean, it's, it's given. But I don't believe, I mean, LAF can protect the agitators' freedom of destruction. So, so with that in mind, I believe LAF troops are operating along those considerations, right? With clear, and, and to my knowledge, I mean, with clear and strict orders not to use live ammunition. However, I recognize there has been cases where those orders were violated. I mean, I'm, no, no one is hiding that. And for that specific case, I understood also that LAF is investigating the circumstances. And, and my expectations are that it will, it will sanction the indicted simply because I am confident that LAF is, is fully aware of the importance of not losing the, the Lebanese people's trust However, one must admit that left cannot side with the protesters or with those who are against them. But I do admit that left may have a dialogue with each one of them. To finish, in my humble opinion, I mean, what left can do, and I speak for myself, I mean, as, as yep. you said, it is to consolidate the Lebanese people's trust by remaining as, as their best hope for ensuring a safe landing for the country in these very difficult and critical times until, until a new capable and reformist government is formed. I truly believe and, and personally believe that this is, this is LAP's bet for the Lebanese people. Okay. Uh, a lot to... Um unpack as far as the history of the institution. Uh, and we're gonna try to do this briefly, uh, Joseph, but um, we'll take you back in history and, um, and tell you obviously that no army functions uh, in a political and social uh, vacuum. Uh, the story of the laugh, I think, will very much help us understand its um, uh, past and present struggles and maybe uh, also identify uh, opportunities uh, that may lie ahead uh, for the institution. Um, I'd like to believe, just based on my own reading of the history of the organization, that, that the LAF has not been given a fair uh, start. Um, tell us why from the days of independence from French rule 1943 uh, to more recent years, uh, there wasn't much of an appetite among Lebanese for a strong national army, not even just among the Lebanese, but also its own neighbors, right? Um, and how has this history uh, affected the evolution of the LAF? A great question, Bilal. I mean, most probably, though, it requires a lengthy answer. Oh, well, absolutely. I'm, <laughs> I'm, very unfair, I'm not sure, but, um, I'm, I'm uh, not sure we have time for that. Uh, no, but I think it's important for the audience to understand right. that, you know, this, this organization has had to deal with a lot, and perhaps most importantly, the yeah. fact that really nobody, until very recently, has wanted this organization to prosper and to function as an actual military, right? Fair, uh, fair enough. Fair yeah, good thing it changed uh -huh. recently, but you have to go through that history a little bit. 
Um, I'm going to try to answer this question in a, in a concise and reasonable manner, and we'll try to highlight the most relevant details there. So the story of LAF, I mean, is, is one of those stories with significant ups and downs in a highly volatile Middle East region. Uh, but, but long story short, it is the story of, a, of a, I would call it, of an unimmune Lebanon with weakened security and military organizations. And I believe, I believe the government of Lebanon after the independence in 1943 intentionally kept its armed forces small and weak due to internal conflict, probably due to, inflict, to internal conflicting sectarian politics. Right. But, but since the 50s, this, the Lebanese politicians, my understanding also is there, they were unwilling to incur the cost of maintaining a large army. Mm -hmm. Most probably, they feared that it would certainly embroil Lebanon in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And later, I mean, we jump now to the civil war in 1975, Right. Those same prominent politicians of all religious groups expressed a sense of insecurity towards each other. Yep. And, with and, and with time, they, they managed to establish and command their own private militias, leading actually to the division of Lebanon in, in multiple sectarian geographic areas. Mm -hmm. And with that, you had, you had a militia security system that was established it weakened LAF and it led to its disintegration. Now, to end the civil war, I mean, just in, in a quick summary, a peace agreement, the Taif Accord came into play in 1990. It was implemented under Syrian control and, and uh, giving that accord, LAF was restructured according to its current organization, but not strengthened. So I'm not gonna go endlessly here. I will finish and say, that, that life evolution really was conditioned primarily by two factors. So one is, I would say, the fear that a strong army should, would erode the personal power of prominent politicians. Right. And, and secondly, let me say that the need for security and stability was really a driving factor when sectarian militias failed to provide safety and security for their own constituencies. Can I add something to it? And I think it's sort of related, uh, which has been the very nature of Lebanese society, which obviously has liberal impulses. And so they've always wanted to evade the authoritarian course of their neighbors, which has taken on a military dominated regime, right? And so they went the completely the opposite way when the pendulum swung too far on the side of freedom, right? To the point of anarchy. And um, I guess you could add that as another factor of keeping the army as, as weak as possible. Well, could, could be. I mean, I mean, that's, 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 I mean, the, the Lebanese Is that people- that too generous always, of an interpretation? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I think the Lebanese people, I mean, has always been uh, for democracy in their, in their aspirations and their freedom of expression and, and the media. I mean, this is, the, this is how they live. I mean, freedom is part of their, of their daily life, but, but, but I mean, you need, you need a security institution to protect that freedom and the, those, the, the, democratic ideals, if I may say. Right. So right. I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really a tricky, a tricky, uh, tricky line to, uh, to, to walk. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, you mentioned the Civil War, uh, Joseph, so I'd be remiss not to mention 1976, right, when the army disintegrated uh, along sectarian lines. Uh, just tell us about that episode. I mean, is that still fresh in the minds of current uh, serving commanders, or is that just too, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a long time ago and it really doesn't affect how the army operates today, how it thinks, and doesn't really fear that this might return? Well, <laughs> yes. I think, I think a practical way to answer your, this, this important question is to expand, is to expand actually on the, on the first one. Yep. One year after the beginning of the Civil War, the army disintegrated, as you said. And, and during those difficult times, I think that soldiers like most of the Lebanese people could not move freely inside Lebanon from one region to another. Right. So you had that soldiers deserted and they joined the militias of their respective religious communities. And so you, you had, as I said, this militia security system. And we had also the Syrian troops present in Lebanon since 1976 and the Israeli army occupying South Lebanon in 1982. So, so as a result, I mean, we end up with few short soldiers left uh, under left's control. 
And Lev then was one of the, I mean, one of the many security actors rather than the sole or dominant one. And later with the end of the civil war, those same politicians again reached the conclusion that only a national army could reunite the country and replace their various militia. And indeed, I mean, Lev as one national army reunited the country and adopted a new approach by including conscription. And it was a good step actually to blend the new generations of young Lebanese in one cohesive social fabric away from sectarianism. But to finish my answer, I think left disintegration is a very important lesson learned for the consecutive left commanders. Uh -huh. and, I, and I trust they will do what it takes to mitigate left disintegration. One, by keeping the country united. But most importantly, I think by shaping left as an institution. And, and I will say also by gaining the Lebanese people's trust by definitely strengthening LAF's foundational principle, LAF's foundational principle of neutrality. I think those are two important components to keep a one cohesive national armed force that, that is at the same distance of all the Lebanese political parties and confession that is able to be trustful and, and, and to appeal to whenever this country is going through uh, security difficulties. Joseph, I'm, I'm of the view that uh, probably nothing has hurt the growth of the uh, Lebanese army more than the era stretching from 1990, which is when the Civil War ended with the signing of the Taif Ta Ta Accord, to <clears throat> 2005, when the last Syrian soldier exited the country as a result of, of course, demonstrations in the streets, more than one million people after the assassination of um, Rafi Harid, the former prime minister, and of course, international primarily U.S. pressure. Um, that was an era that was called Pax Syriana, which is essentially dominated by the Syrian intelligence Absolutely. in the country and also the Syrian uh, army. What can you share with an American audience of how um, destructive that uh, period was, not just for the country, but more specifically for the army in terms of its growth, in terms of its evolution? I mean, Bilal, your question, your question is highlighting actually a critical period in LAF's evolution after the 1990 Taif Accord. A long period, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, given, given that accord and being under Syrian control, LAF was, LAF was restructured in its current form. It was partially rearmed and professionalized right. with, with a desire to reach confessional balance and to integrate, let me say, around 6,000 former militiamen from, from different political orientations in exchange to dismantle their existing militias, but except for Hezbollah, of course. And, and then based on these considerations, Left Command intentionally blended the troops coming from the different parts of Lebanon to shape Left and attempt, I say, to shape Left into one national social institutions. Nevertheless, I think between 2000, between 1990 and 2005, being under what I call the pervasive Syrian influence mm -hmm. and the lack of monopoly of, of the legitimate use of force, LAF was unable to establish an independent defensive strategy. And so and as, as a result, you had Lebanon relying on Syrian troops to, to enforce effective control over the entire territory to the extent to have the Syrian and Hezbollah ensuring Lebanon's defense. So to finish here, I think the result was that LAF adopted a NADOC modus operandi, mm -hmm. working on reunification and restructuring, but not on LAF strengthening. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly didn't help that some of the commanders who presided over that period were obviously under the influence of Damascus, and so therefore they had to be quite sensitive to the wishes of uh, Damascus, and that, that certainly played a big role. All right, let me let me take you to some operational issues because I think there will be a uh, a lot of interest to some former CENTCOM colleagues of mine and folks who have a a lot of interest in military issues. So let me take you to December thirty first, nineteen ninety nine. Country in the whole world was obviously getting ready for millennium celebrations. 
maybe already celebrating depending on where you were. Uh, and a relatively small and obscure band of Sunni uh, fanatics called the Takfir and Hijra yeah. launched an attack on the military in the town of Dunia, which is in the northern part of the country uh, near Tripoli, which is Lebanon's second largest uh, city, what we also call the capital of the north, right? That episode shocked the Lebanese and brought back, you know, fears of widespread violence. Um, tell us what happened then. How did the army deal with that mini insurrection, which obviously I should say that it was ultimately defeated uh, by uh, the Lebanese army. I guess that would be the first episode of a violent confrontation and the first test, I guess, uh, uh, after the end of the civil war between the army and, you know, a local uh, opponent or a local enemy. Absolutely. Not sure, not, not sure about the local thing, though. But let me tell you one thing. Well, shocked, I mean, the word you use is, is a very good description to what was felt during that time. Because, I mean, after, after almost nine years of stability under Syrian control, the terrorist group Al-Takfir wal hujra succeeded in launching an attempt to create an Islamist mini-state in northern Lebanon. I mean, those terrorists from different nationalities infiltrated, as you said, the mountainous area, mountainous area in, in the Dini district in northern Lebanon. And, and after, after an intense combat that lasted eight days, actually, they, they were swiftly defeated by a force of 13,000 Lebanese soldiers backed by tanks and artillery. And for that combat, Laf reported, if I recall the numbers right, yeah, I think I, think I have a total of 12 soldiers killed in action, uh -huh. while on the insurgent side, they were like 55 captured. So when interrogated, the, the captured terrorists admitted receiving financial support from associates of bin Laden, Osama bin Laden. Uh -huh. And this is why I told you, I mean, I don't believe it's, it was pretty local. I mean, uh -huh. we are talking here January 2000. And this same interrogation led to the identification of a transnational terrorist net network linked to the Dunia group. And that same network was indicted for involvement in the millennium bombing plots in Jordan, Los Angeles, and India. To finish, I think the importance of this battle was first in its, in its contribution to dismantle, if I may say, transnational terrorist networks, mm -hmm. right? And secondly, and you name it, I mean, in, in your question, and, and I, I agree, I mean, it was for me a building block for the forthcoming GLAF's journey in the right. war against terrorism. Right. And that's the reason why I mentioned it, Giselle, because as, as, as um, comprehensive as the operation was uh, against ISIS just uh, in recent years, in 2017, uh, and also the North, um, I, I just wanted to highlight this was not the first time that the LAF actually had uh, engaged uh, such an enemy. It, it did way back in 2000 or 1999, I should say. And then, of course, in 2007 in the Halibadid, which we will talk about uh, in a minute. So it's, it's been a, quite a, an experience uh, uh, of confrontation with this uh, kind of enemy. Uh, but before we get to Nahal Barid, obviously 2005, as we just agreed, uh, you and I, was a turning point in not only in the history of the country, but also in the history of the institution, because this is when the Syrians uh, were forced uh, to withdraw. Um, just bring me back to what um, perceptions uh, existed then, or what feelings were f uh, uh, shared by the Lebanese uh, uh, army leadership at the time. Uh, when the Syrians left, was there jubilation? Uh, was there a worry uh, that now that they have to take over, you know, uh, security of the country on their own? Or is it a mix of both? Uh, how was the uh, uh, feeling at the time when the Syrians withdrew from the country? Indeed, indeed. I mean, I agree. 2005 was definitely a turning point in Lebanon's history, and, and LAF is no exception. To start answering your question, I think it's, uh, it's important to remember that 2005 started with a terrible event, the assassination of Prime Minister Rafi Hariri. Right. And, and as a result, you had those huge demonstrations that reached up to one million people. You had on one side demonstrations calling for a swift withdrawal of the Syrian troops out of Lebanon, while on the other side you had demonstrations led by Hezbollah against 
the withdrawal of Syria. Additionally, and I would fortunate and, and additionally, and I would say fortunately, you had U.S. President George Bush spearheading the international community's calls in support of the Lebanese people's demand for Syria to withdraw from Lebanon. And as a result, you had the Syrian withdrew in 2005, knowing that the Israeli previously withdrew from southern Lebanon into southern. So now you have this, this whole situation, as you can imagine. It created, at the same time, a huge security vacuum on one hand. And on the other hand, I think it's created a momentum for left to gain. And left did seize that opportunity. And in fact, it extended its influence on the southern part of the country. And at the same time, it adopted, if I may call it as such, I mean, an offensive, an offensive posture uh, uh, towards, towards internal destabilizing forces. It is worth mentioning, though, that during that time, NAF renewed its commitment to its foundational principle of neutrality on both the sectarian and the political levels. It was actually a clear demonstrated, it was clearly demonstrated in left's refusal to oppress the collective civil, civil demonstrations. Uh, I will end up here by saying that left's refusal, I think this is important, was, was an important step in the attempt to overcome political interferences. And I mean by that a refusal when orders from the government clash with left's foundational principle of neutrality. Let me uh, take you to 2003, 2004, immediately after the U.S. invasion of Iraq um, and occupation afterwards. And once that country descended into chaos, I think it was only a matter of time before you know, violent extremism uh, spread across the region and once again reared its ugly head in Lebanon. Uh, and that, that happened uh, a couple of years later, uh, as you very well know, uh, on May 20th, 2007, which was exactly, ironically, two years after the Syrians had left the country. Uh, you wonder about the coincidence. Um, and uh, a group called Fath al-Islam, maybe not as obscure as Takfir al-Hijra because we had known that they had been operating in the north for some time, uh, quite a proficient mobilization campaign, a good bit of training uh, in the north, and of course, uh, expansion of their presence and influence from one uh, refugee camp to another and actually expelling rival Palestinian groups to settle and set up shop ultimately in uh, Nahal al um, If the Dunyi confrontation was challenging, was bloody, this was a completely different kettle of fish. Uh, this made the knee look like a walk in the park. Obviously, uh, the casualties were much more severe for the army. It was far more challenging. The terrain was obviously very different. This was an urban environment uh, in which the lab had very little experience. Uh, the intelligence was poor. Uh, certainly, it lasted much longer, three months, and it ultimately required the complete destruction of the camp, essentially, in order to achieve a military victory. Uh, and I should say that 174 service, service members of the lab uh, died as a result. Tell us about those very tense uh, moments, uh, three months, essentially, and uh, how did you ultimately achieve victory? No doubt, I mean, Bilal, no doubt, a very heavy loss for the lab. I mean, the finest of its men. It was the most severe internal fighting since Lebanon's civil war, as you said, with a nil equipped and underfunded LAF. Right. Just imagine the situation. Nevertheless, I mean, LAF in this battle proved to be to a certain degree, I mean, proved its professional cohesion and cohesion, its professionalism and cohesion, in purging, on, I mean, on a large scale, around 400 terrorists hidden in the Palestinian refugee camp of Nahr al -Bari. It is, It is one of the densest populated areas, by the way, in Northern Lebanon. So after enforcing a sea and land blockade around the camp, LAF secured, su succeeded in securing a safe passage for exiting women, children, and the elderly held inside the camp. Yep. 
Right after, LAF used heavy artillery fires to eliminate snipers posted down the camp. And those same snipers, by the way, were behind the, the heavy human loss on, on the left side. Finally, LAF succeeded in securing avenues of approach for attacking the terrorists. And the conflict finally ended after three months of intense combat. With having LAF taking control of the camp at a very heavy cost, as you name it, I mean, 174 soldiers killed and more than 500 wounded. Right. I mean, while on the insurgent side, you had like, I, I recall two to one, I think was the ratio. Yep. 350 were killed and 19 captured. Yeah. So really here, I would like to stress, I mean, on a, on a LAF accomplishment in this, in this, in this whole combat. During that combat, I mean, LAF was lacking air support, uh -huh. and you had a LAF engineering regiment jointly with the Lebanese Air Force yep. achieved what what I was, I mean, what I would like to call a, a feat of ingenuity, uh, yep. if I may call it as such. And, and together, they, they changed the dynamic of the battle right. by converting, believe it or not, I mean, UH-1 helicopters into bombers, yep. arming them with 880 pounds conventional bombs from the old grounded Hawker Hunter and Mirage right. 3 fighter jets. That's right. It was, actually, it was actually a decisive step that considerably shortened the conflict. Yep. And Lev walked out of this battle victorious and strengthened by an overwhelming popular support. Not only that, it was also praised by the international partners to be a professional, strong, and a cohesive force acting in, conform in conformity with international standards. And I mean by that the Geneva Conventions and the law of land warfare. Uh, let's stay with that about it for a bit because once again, this is one of the most consequential battles uh, until of course, uh, um, 2017 um, yeah. in the history of the lab. Um, you, you had a camp here that was obviously protected by uh, a ton of buildings, right? And also underground bunkers that were used by the Palestinians in previous years to escape uh, Israeli raids, right? So that made it even more complicated for uh, this makeshift bomber, as you just described, basically, to hit its targets. Um, my understanding is that perhaps less than a week after the start of the campaign, the laugh was essentially running out of weapons. Uh, and it became very clear that sustaining the fight was going to be the biggest challenge. And this is when the international community intervened, whether it's the, uh, the Arab partners uh, of the LAF and of course the United States. Tell us how critical basically was that assistance at the time uh, in order to achieve success? I think uh, when, when I started uh, my answer, I said, I mean, LAF was engaged in that fight with a, a nil uh, uh, equipped and underfunded LAF. So really it wasn't in the best conditions to be able to sustain itself during that fight. And I think this is where it was instrumental. I mean, the, 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 the air bridge that the US has uh, activated uh, in order to supply lab with enough ammunition and, and weaponry, I mean, uh, enough to, uh, to ensure that uh, LAF can, uh, will be able to sustain itself during that combat. And I think what, this was uh, tremendously important. And uh, the U.S. continues to, to, to stay next to the LAF. I mean, whenever it is engaged in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in combat against terrorism and LAF at, at the same time, I think it's proving that it is a trustworthy partner in the fight against terrorism. Uh, one final question about that about it then. Sorry to dwell too much on that battle. Uh, since it's one of the things that I study as far as the military operations of the LAF, um, your role at the time uh, was quite critical because part of, it was a part of the strategy of basically encircling the camp and also making sure that the fighters would not escape uh, from uh, the sea, right? Because obviously the camp uh, was bordering the Mediterranean Sea, so they could have smuggled, you know, boats and um, whether it flew to Cyprus or Syria or what have you. Uh, tell us more about the role of as modest as the capabilities were, obviously, of the Navy. Um, and they still are, uh, unfortunately. Tell us what role did, uh, did you play at the time? What role did the uh, Navy play? Which, let's, let's be very frank, it, it was more of a Coast Guard force more than anything else. It is, absolutely, it is. I mean, 
uh, with, with, the, with modest capabilities that the Navy had during that time and still, I think. It, I mean, but it's uh, the, the, the thing is... Was the there fire support power, from sea? Sorry. I, I, absolutely. I mean, this is what I'm going to end up with. Is, is it was, uh, most importantly, a blockade. I mean, certainly from the sea to, to, uh, to hamper, if you want, or to deny uh, any, any supplies coming from the sea to the Nahrabad or the escape of any terrorists from there. And the second one is to uh, support the land forces by, by uh, fire support from, from the sea. Uh, uh, according to the modest gunnery that it would be, that is what existed, I mean, that existed on, on board the, the left ships. But definitely, I mean, it put the left Navy in a good position because on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the aisle, I mean, you didn't have, uh, uh, um, uh, naval capabilities that would uh, compete with, with, with the Navy uh, modest capabilities. Right. Okay. Um, a decade later. Yeah. We're going to take you now to um, uh, Donna the Outskirts uh, campaign, uh, once again in the northern part of the country, northeastern frontier, um, along the borders uh, with uh, Syria, but also inside Lebanese territory and Arsal and other places. Uh, so it took a decade basically for the lab to learn some lessons from the Helbarid to develop its capabilities, obviously in uh, close partnership with the United States, um, learn some new tricks, uh, do some proper planning. Uh, tell me about that battle. Obviously it did not last three months this time around. The casualties were minimal. And this was a campaign that was praised by top CENTCOM leadership and also U.S. defense officials. So tell me why was it very different in 2017? Obviously, it's, it's hard to compare apple to apple. This was a very different terrain. This was up in the mountains, rugged terrain, open field. The intel was so much better uh, and partly in, you know, as a result of better planning, obviously. Uh, and of course, the capabilities, uh, scan eagle equipment and all that sort of stuff. But just in terms of performance, in terms of uh, how the LAF conducted its operations, why was it so much better? Why was it a, such an incredibly different result? And of course, we're talking about a campaign against ISIS, obviously, uh, yeah. also a different kettle of fish, far better armed, uh, 600 of them operating, having launched already multiple operations against the army and also uh, kidnapped a few, as, as, as I'm sure you'll mention, one of the aims of the operation of uh, Dawn of the Outskirts was to at least learn of the fate of the 10 kidnapped Lebanese soldiers by ISIS. But uh, I'll stop here. Tell me more about that absolutely monumental uh, campaign that has, I would say, perhaps unfairly, dramatically changed the image of the LAF as a far more competent uh, military in the Arab world and probably one of the best. Well, I guess, I think Uncle Sam might have something to do with it. Okay. <laughs> what do they do? No, but, <laughs> no, but, but to, answer, to answer your question, I think it's, it is critical to recall the context that preceded the eviction of the uh, of ISIS militants in 2017. Uh -huh. I mean, if you if, if you recall, I mean, after the rise of, the rise of ISIS in the Middle East uh, of uh, Middle East region, I mean, you know, ISIS was gaining ground in Iraq and Syria, right. taking advantage of open borders and the Syrian civil war. So, in 2014, ISIS progression reached uh, the town of Arsal. And Arsala was saying that it was a remote Lebanese village at the eastern border with Syria. And now you had Lebanon facing this alarming and critical situation. And Lebanon actually was the only nation and left, and left alone. I think it was the only army to have successfully repelled ISIS invasion after severe fights for almost three years. And the achievement of halting ISIS militants was mainly due, in my opinion, to the already significant border defense and surveillance forces supported originally by the United Kingdom, who assisted LAF to build protected border observation posts and forward operating bases on the eastern border areas. Yep. During that time, LAF was closely monitoring, as you said, all ISIS activities and operations, not only from the border observation posts, 
but also by using air platforms with long range ISR provided originally by the US. So you have now in August 2017, LAF is ready to launch its Operation Dawn of the Hills, a successful offensive military operations against ISIS militants deployed in bunkers, caves, and tunnels. And you have that within 10 days, LAF's operation demonstrated efficiency and speed, and it brought back the authority of the Lebanese state to those border area. But of course, this time, I mean, after 10 years, was much less than in 2007, as you mentioned. But this time, the main difference in performance was due to left, to left gained experience, I would say. Taking advantage of generations of experienced officers. So you had the lieutenants and captains of Nahr al Barid combat in 2007, where in 2017 now, the majors, colonels, and generals leading left troops and those same officers with their troops were amongst those who made good use of capabilities such as precision guided munitions, mm -hmm. ISR, air support, air, ground, air coordinate and coordinated ground maneuver. And in my humble opinion, I think it was the result absolutely of a left performance, but it was definitely boosted by, by a US steadfast assistant that never stopped since 2006. And, and it was most importantly, and I think this is very important, it, it was starting to pay off dividends. Yep. So to close, I believe US assistance was instrumental in ensuring last victory. It played a decisive role by covering for most, I mean, the conduct of combined arms maneuver, area reconnaissance, integrated fires, and by most important training generations, as I said, of Lebanese, officers and soldiers who continue to have a great professional impact on LAF, by the way. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think all this is ensuring the scoring of what I call excellent professional military performances. Let me use that term that you just used, which is interesting, decisive. So the very final moments of that battle, the LAF <laughs> was, the. I think you know what I'm going to talk don't, about, right? Don't take me there. <laughs> no, I, I, I will because it's important. It's it's uh, uh it's the interest of history. So, the final moments of that battle, the laugh was robbed a decisive victory because of a certain event. What happened? A deal. There has been a deal going on. A deal between between Hezbollah and ISIS. Okay, that led to the evacuation of a certain it's, number it's of a, fighters it's, back it's, to Syria. It's, it's a strange combination, but yeah, yeah, as you said, I mean, and they they were able to uh, to uh, withdraw them in, in a convoy and buses, and uh, and uh, and uh, we were still uh, full victory. Yes, absolutely. You know, this is a hugely critical. Um, piece uh, in U.S. public opinion and certainly in, uh, in Congress. Uh, as far as coordination with Hezbollah on the ground, has it always been limited throughout the campaign to simply deconfliction between the LAF and Hezbollah, right? Yeah. Was there, because uh, there's been a lot of concerns around here that there was more than that, or there was actually partnership or co cooperation. Could you tell us a little bit more about that throughout the battle? Was it simply limited to deconfliction and nothing else? No, I don't think there was any 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 uh, any uh, coordination or cooperation or for deconfliction purposes with Hezbollah, and, and uh, I made sure to 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 state it uh, in the right way. I mean, LAF was alone the only army to be able to repel ISIS fighters uh, uh, from from the eastern border. I mean. To, 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 to halt them at the eastern border. And the conduct of this, uh, this campaign, I mean, the dawn of the hills, was, was, was purely a left, a left, a left uh, victory. Okay. Can I put my finger on what I believe, and I think you'll agree with me, what was truly exceptional about that battle, which obviously is very different from what happened in Al-Badid and what happened in 1999-2000. This was the first, tell me if I'm wrong, the first operation waged by the LAV that actually used combined arms in a joint fashion. Is that correct? It, it is correct. Tell me what, for, for, for audiences who are not as well versed in military affairs, what does that really mean? 
Does that mean multiple services, branches, units working simultaneously together in an integrated fashion? I think you're putting your finger here on, a, on another feat of ingenuity of, of LAF's achievement, I mean, in that battle, by uh, lasing from an airplane uh, uh, over ISIS targets, I mean, uh, for, for the, uh, for, uh, for uh, laser-guided uh, munitions, I mean, from the artillery to, to that was, that was a, a, a really, I mean, high risk, but very critical combination that was also uh, 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 put LAF on a, on, a, on a successful track in, in, in its targeting and in, in diminishing uh, ISIS, ISIS uh, deployment. Is that the future, uh, Joseph? Is the future of the army a special forces oriented kind of army, small, nimble, agile, integrated? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends on the threat that you are talking about. I mean, right. I'm not sure, I'm, I, mean I mean, if we're talking anti-terrorism, I, I definitely agree with you, I mean, with your description. But you know, I mean, in, in, in the context of LAF, I think there is a lot of threats to be taken into consideration. And uh, of course, terrorism on the, is on the top of the list. But I think you should, as a, as, a, as a standing army, you should take into consideration that you might have an open conflict with uh, another army. You should be able also to tailor your capabilities as to be an effective anti-terrorist organized uh, anti-terrorism fighting force, and I think here you need to put more emphasis on special forces, on on on, on combination with air assets, special forces. And yes, I think this is this is definitely the future. Low cost, high impact, high return. Right, and obviously, let's be honest. We're talking about Israel in the event of deterring potential uh, conventional aggression. Obviously, given the history of conflict between the two sides. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, you talked about Uncle Sam. Let's talk a little bit more about that in the final few minutes. Uh, tell us about your, uh, the last partnership uh, with the U.S. military. How, how does this partnership, um, uh, how has it evolved? What does it mean to the LAV? Uh, and if you could just give us like maybe one or two nuggets uh, based on your experience uh, that could uh, shed some light on how this partnership has specifically contributed to the development and evolution of the left. This partnership is, is a strong partnership that goes back, as I said, to 2006. And I think today, if I, if, I, if I have the numbers right, I mean, the U.S. assistance has reached up to 90% of the total international assistance to the lab. It is covering a very, a very broad and extensive support under numerous assistance programs, to name some FMF, CTPF, IMET, institution building, DETRA, and others. And all are to the benefit of LAF, land forces, Navy, Air Force, and the U.S. assistance, I mean, no, no doubt, has strengthened and empowered the different capability of LAF, such as fire support, maneuver and combat, close air support, ISR, logistic support, border control and security, and we'll get into this later on. I mean, and, and most importantly, I think the United States also assisted in training generation of officers, as I said, impacting LAF in a great professional way. And not to forget, I mean, the, the defense institution building program that is really pushing the institutionalization and modernization of LAF by structuring its defense governance management. Yep. And LAF, in fact, is embracing and consolidating the security assistance with an excellent cooperation. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's best highlighted when, when you see how the Lebanese and American officers are seizing those opportunities to consolidate, I would say, forward constructive steps of security and stability. And to be more specific, I think the land border security project is one case in point. It's a project initially based on the provisions set out by the UN Security Council Resolution 1701, and just to clarify, I mean, between brackets, it's a resolution adopted by the UN Security Council to end the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. So this border project, you have this border project implemented on the eastern and northern Lebanese borders, 
It's one of the brightest examples of this productive partnership. It's a demonstration, in my opinion, of opening one's mind to new thinking and new possibilities to secure at the same time, I mean, US and Lebanese common interests. Yep. And here, I mean, ultimately you're forging a better outcome for all. So in fact, this land border security project is, is really of great strategic impact on Lebanon's security and stability and the region, I would say. And to conclude, I, I strongly believe that the us left partnership is not only contributing to lab development and evolution, but strongly it is also shaping Lebanon's stability and, and security. Let me ask you two final uh, questions, uh, Joseph, um, and stay on the topic of uh, the partnership with the United States. Um, without patting yourself too much on the back, why do you think that the LAF and this is not me, I, like I said, according to Tem, top CENTCOM leadership, why do you think that the LAF stands out really? What is it about this institution that makes them more professionally competent, better able to fight than most other, at least Arab armies in the region? Wow, well, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a very good question to ask to CENTCOM leadership itself, by you know what they ask here, like when they say, ask uh, similar questions, what is the secret sauce? So what is the secret sauce of the left? Uh, Recognizing that there are many, many imperfections, obviously, that we can get into, but uh, there are certain, certainly some things that have actually worked. And, and I'd love to highlight that. Obviously, you're insisting on taking me there. So let me answer your question by the, saying the following. Let me start by saying actually on that on several occasions you had CENTCOM commanders, especially I think General Votel and now General McKinsey. They both underscored the importance of strong LAF partnership with LAF. And I believe, I believe, I mean, by their words, I believe CENTCOM approves some convincing facts, and I would say also compelling factors. So I think CENTCOM, CENTCOM sees LAF as definitely as the Lebanese people's most trusted and respected institution. It's an institution of national cohesion. I think also CENTCOM shares with the Lebanese people the sentiment that, that LAF should be the only one that can protect the Lebanese people from security threat. Mm -hmm. And I guess also that CENTCOM appreciates the existence of an excellent cooperation and a great developed military to military relationship. Right. But, but you know, not only that, I personally believe that it's, it's also about LAF's clean track record of end user monitoring and LAF's track record of commitment and sacrifices in the fight against terrorism. And we've talked about some today with you. And in this context, context, I think, I think CENTCOM appreciations extend to LAF's willingness to fight. And as stressed on my watch by many American officers, and literally, I quote, I mean, LAF soldiers demonstrated, LAF soldiers demonstrated captivating fighting spirit and a wow. capability to embrace new military concepts and technologies. End of quote. And to finish, I mean, I truly believe that CENTCOM's support to LAF is, is making of LAF an institution of increased competence, a true fighting force. And, and uh, if I may say, I mean, also a trustworthy partner. And my guess, I mean, is that all of this I think all of this is meaningful to Santcom. Yeah. Can I add one element to it, half jokingly? You know, sometimes, <laughs> yes. it, sometimes it helps to be poor and with little leverage, which means that you really have to be extra sensitive to the preferences of your senior partner. And I think the, the LAF has been extremely sensitive to the wishes and the preferences of the Americans because they know that the biggest source of support remains Washington. And if that kind of assistance is cut if it's reduced in amounts then actually as a matter of fact I'll, I'll ask you that question if washington pulls the plug tomorrow on the assistance or drastically reduces it can the laugh survive 
Absolutely not. But well, you want to expand on you want to expand on this one, or you want to tackle it later? We got one more minute, so if you want to say a word about that, if you want to use that as final thoughts. No, I think I think you know what I'll tell yeah, you why. I mean, in, in, in a couple of words. Just, uh, yes, go just ahead. Have related to policy, actually, because why don't we just like end with that note? Because there's been some voices, and this is no secret. Uh, I was privy to them when I was in uh, the Pentagon, and as you very well know, uh, it's been even reported in the media. This is no secret whatsoever. There's yeah. been a lot of voices coming from various agencies uh, in the United States government uh, uh, proposing to either cut or reduce the amount of assistance that go to the lab for concerns, reasons related to uh, Hezbollah or and whatever wrongly perceived uh, uh, um, relationship between the LAF and Hezbollah or the fact that the LAF wasn't doing enough to disarm or to counter Hezbollah. So let's just say that those voices come back or um, become more influential, and as a result, the assistance is cut or it's reduced. Can the LAF survive? And if it cannot, as you just said yourself, what is the alternative? Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm I don't. I, I'm not sure there is enough convincing evidence to support, I mean, a statement that LAF is really, I mean, accomplice with Hezbollah or whatever. But, I mean, still allow me to highlight a couple of important things here the way I personally see them. So first, let's, uh, let us admit, I mean, let us admit that the Lebanese circumstances are quite exceptional and complicated, right? And one of these most pertinent complications is that the use of military force is not exclusive to the lab. And I, in my opinion, this is, this is a real challenge for any legal security organization, and LAF is no exception. Right. So based on that truth, and for the sake of internal security and stability, in my opinion, realities on the ground imply and require LAF to have a kind of a interest-based engagement with all the Lebanese parties. And I guess Hezbollah is one of them. And I, and I would say, I would, I would describe that engagement for deconfliction purposes in order to establish, and in my opinion, this is the, the most important goal, a controlled situation. An objective of great importance in the Lebanese context, in my opinion. And in that same context, I think, one should remember also that LAF is a melting pot of the different Lebanese religious groups. Absolutely. With a well-balanced military assignments. Additionally, one should consider that LAF has a centralized command and control structure. That's right. And, and the way military decision-making dots, I mean, you, you need to understand how they're connected, these dots. And most importantly, I think one needs to assess and balance LAF's delivery in securing national interests and Lebanon's international security commitments versus, I mean, if it's securing partisan interest. I will end here and shift gears now, I mean, to address specifically what you're talking about regarding the consequences of stopping US assistance to the LAF. Well, I, I strongly believe it will be very serious and negative consequences. And, and if the intent behind such action is to degrade Hezbollah, well, personally, I don't believe the suspension of US assistance to the LAF may, may reverse Hezbollah's strategy in Lebanon and in the region. And in my humble opinion, I think all this is basically a zero sum game. So what LAF loses, Hezbollah gains. And in fact, stopping US assistance would weaken LAF, definitely. But at the same time, it would consolidate furthermore Hezbollah military influence. And I, I, I think also it would leave Hezbollah as a sole significant military force in Lebanon, strengthening by that both Hezbollah political and military ambitions on one hand, and Iran regional hegemony on the other hand. Yeah. And I think this will definitely undermine Lebanon's stability. Yeah. So here, I mean, and in that, in that context, I think the question remains is, 
Is, is a stable Lebanon in the interest of America? Today, LAF is stronger and more capable because of US assistance. Right. And LAF is depending on it. And in my opinion, stopping or reducing it while Lebanon is enduring this current unprecedented difficult economic crisis, I think it would be hugely detrimental to life sustainability and operational readiness. Yeah, we haven't talked about that also. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and of course, I mean, the expectations are, in my opinion, that this whole situation would further undermine Lebanon's stability and security, of course. But here's the, the, the thing is, is given that left supposed future and capacity to honor its international and national security commitments. But moreover, I mean, this is now, I think you can add this to, 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 to my answer also, is that we all know that nature abhors a vacuum. And I mean by that, I mean, if, if the US withdraw its support, personally, I have reasons to believe that many on the other side of the spectrum are waiting in line to fill the gap. Look at China's vote on August 31st for Unifil Renewal to implement the UN Security Council Resolution 1701. Right. That's a very good example of what to expect. Yeah. Furthermore, I believe, and I know you've wrote something about that. I mean, we are in the middle of a war of ideas and information operations are, are at the heart of it. And when considering the Lebanese theater, the Lebanese, public opinion or, or public support, you name it, is, is by excellence, in my opinion, the center of gravity. Therefore, if US commitment to strengthen LAF is to continue, I'm confident that it would consolidate furthermore Lebanon's stability, strengthening by that, that the national consent over LAF's role, and it would increase Lebanese public support and the political backup to the LAF. And to finish answering your question, I believe we all agree, Bilal, that the duty of LAF is to defend Lebanon. And that is despite Hezbollah's position. This is the duty of LAF. By reducing or suspending US security assistance, I think we will have, we will have a LAF not able to play its role as a defender. And in my opinion, this is the crux of the whole subject here that this is the perfect justification for Hezbollah. Yep, no, well said, well said. I wish we could go longer, uh, Joseph. Uh, I used the excuse of our brief stoppage to go over for another 10 minutes, but I'm pretty sure the events team will give me a hard time about it. And I also put you sufficiently in a lot of trouble with your former colleagues, but um, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I think it's an important conversation to be had most transparently, most candidly, uh, given how uh, important it is for US policy here. Uh, we'll have another conversation at some other time uh, soon, hopefully now that you're a member of the uh, family at MEI. I want to thank you on behalf of the MEI uh, uh, leadership uh, for participating with us. Uh, thank you for taking the time and uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we will uh, upload uh, the video as soon as possible and I'll share it with you, Joseph, in case you want to share it with your former colleagues. So thank sure. you once again, Joseph. Really appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk soon, okay? Thank you very much, Bilal. I appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Take care, Joseph.